and I would like to first welcome you to the program. My name is Jessica Lori, and I'm the program director at the Interfaith Center at Miami University. We are a nonprofit organization whose mission is to invite people from diverse secular, spiritual, and religious traditions to participate in one another's practices in order to cultivate appreciative understanding and friendship. We seek to unify people around common moral, social, and ethical concerns in order to build a more just and equitable society. So we have a series that we've been hosting for a while now, and we have uh, a new episode, I guess you could call it, a new program to add to that this evening. And that is our series that's called the Faith Sharing Series, where we feature different religions and faith traditions and invite um, an, an expert or a leader from that tradition to join us and share a little bit about it with us. So this evening we'll be talking about Shaivism and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail because that's why our guest is here. So I would like to welcome Sadhguru Bodhinatha Balan Swami. Uh, Bodhinatha began studying Vedanta and meditation in 1960 soon developing a deep interest in monastic life. He met Shivaya Subramuniaswami, Subramuniaswami, pardon me, affectionately known as Gurudeva in 1964, and he joined his monastery in 1965. In March of 1972, he received Sanyas Diksha initiation by Gurudeva and his Sri Subramunia Ashram in Sri Lanka. At the time of Gurudeva's transition in 2001, Bodhinatha was installed as Guru Maha Sanidhanam of Kauai Adinam and the 163rd preceptor of the Kailasha Parampara. Bodhinatha is the current spiritual head of Shaiva Siddhanta Church and Himalayan Academy and chairman of Hindu Endowment, Hindu Heritage Endowment, pardon me, and as publisher of Hinduism Today magazine, he carries forward Guru Deva's vision to inform, strengthen, and connect Hindus around the world. He travels frequently to be with and initiate members to give lectures to Hindu groups, attend temple festivals and events, and to oversee the mission in other nations. So welcome this evening, Bodhinatha, and we'll invite you to go ahead and begin your presentation for being here. Thank you, Jessica. Attempt to uh, share the screen here. Here we are. And everyone sees that, I guess, interface. <clears throat> so I'm very happy to be part of this interfaith gathering and have a presentation to show on Saivism. Oh, it has a little introduction here first about the monastery where we have the hardship duty of living in Hawaii, but somebody has to. We can't all be visitors, and we're on the Hawaiian island of Kauai. This is our entrance archway. You get a sense of how green we are here. And this is a short video. I'm going to attempt to get the sound to come across. Tropical rainforests, soaring cliffs, cerulean seas, cascading waterfalls. This remote island is home to Kauai's Hindu monastery, a center of global outreach for Hinduism and intense spiritual practice, leading to experience of the divine within all. Its guru lineage is rooted in the Saiva tradition of Sri Lanka and South India, extending back 2,200 years to the Himalayas. The monastery was founded by Satguru Savaya Subramunia Swami and thrives today under the guidance of Satguru Bodhinatha Velanswami. In the Karavu Temple, visitors encounter the powerful blessings of God Shiva, Ganesha, and Kartikeya. Against the majestic backdrop of Mount Waialeale sits the crown jewel, the all-granite, hand-carved Iraivan Temple, inspired by Guru Deva's mystical visions of Shiva. Here, Bodhinatha and two dozen tireless monks live a joyous life committed to God-realization, worship of Shiva, and selfless religious service. They grow their own food and wear hand-spun robes. 
Yet hidden amidst it all, there dwells a high-tech world where monks sit at Macintosh computers, crafting books, videos, websites, and the international magazine Hinduism Today. We invite you to explore our resource-rich website, where Hinduism meets the future. He has a great voice, doesn't he? <laughs> okay, so as the photo and the video of our all granite hand carved temple is an older one, this is a newer one. It shows off the recently completed lava rock plinth. You can see there that from the ground up about three or four feet is lava rock, and then on top of that is the all granite hand carved temple. This is another photo. This is from the sanctum looking out. So you get a sense of the pillars and everything in the sanctum doors. These are four temple carvers from India. They carve by hand, old fashioned way with chisels and mallets. They finished their work a few months ago and returned to India. That's the monastery. Now we have a little bit on the founder. Sadhguru Savaya Subramunya Swami, affectionately known as Gurudeva, was born in California in 1927 and grew up near Lake Tahoe. Orphaned at age 11, he was raised by a family friend who had spent years in India and who brought him into the culture and beliefs of Hinduism. Trained in classical Eastern and Western dance and in the disciplines of yoga, he became the premier danseur of the San Francisco Ballet at age 19. At the height of his career, he renounced the world, and in 1947, he sailed to India in quest of his spiritual master. In a remote Sri Lankan cave, he fasted and meditated until he burst into enlightenment. Soon after, he met Siva Yogaswami, who gave him the name Subramunya, and initiated him into Hindu monasticism. From then on, the great truths flooded through him like a torrent. The nature of reality and metaphysical principles and methods for facing life's challenges were obvious to him. What philosophers struggle to explain in complex theories, he articulated in simple language from his own experience. Ultimately, the cream of his inspired talks became the 3,000-page trilogy of dancing, living, and merging with Shiva the first cogent comprehensive expression of monistic Saiva Siddhanta in the English language. Powerful purpose drove his every effort like the rhythm of a vigorous dance. He traveled widely to uplift Hindu communities on every continent, represented his religion at global conferences, and helped establish 37 temples worldwide. Extraordinary mystic, Gurudeva had many visions of the deities, he read clairvoyantly from interplane scriptures and created his own language, Shum, to map for others the profound states he encountered in meditation. Gurudeva was loved by all who met him, Hindus, leaders of all lineages, island neighbors, and ordinary folks. He saw the divine in every person and taught them to see the divine in themselves. To devotees everywhere, the graceful six-foot-two white-haired guru was the embodiment of Lord Shiva himself. Gurudeva passed in November 2001. However, from the inner world, he continues to guide in magical ways all who embrace his teachings. His light lives on in their spirit and their striving for truth. End of the founder. Before we talk about Saivism, we're going to talk about Hinduism in general, otherwise it won't make sense. So we have some basic information on Hinduism, and most of this is drawn from our book, Path to Shiva. What is Hinduism? Hinduism is the ancient religion of India practiced today by one billion people all over the world, with no founder and stretching back unknown thousands of years in India's earliest known civilizations. Hinduism is called Sanatana Dharma, the eternal faith. It is based on the Vedas and other scriptures. Four beliefs are most central. First is belief in one supreme God who created the universe and who abides everywhere within it. Though the fact that all Hindus believe in a one supreme being is not necessarily understood, but that's the case. 
he, she is all and in all. Second is belief in the law of karma, the principle of cause and effect, action and reaction, that's well known today. Third is belief that the cosmos is governed by the principle of dharma, which is divine order, righteousness and duty. Fourth, Hindus believe in reincarnation, the natural process of birth, death, and rebirth. While these four convictions are essential in Hinduism, belief alone is not enough to propel us forward on the path. Our actions and behavior are the keys to spiritual progress. Hindus seek to experience God and their inner self through temple worship, meditation, yoga, pilgrimage, and devotional singing. They enjoy a rich family life and ageless traditions of culture. They honor gurus, saints, and sages. They worship many gods who are grand helpers to the Supreme Being. The three pillars of Sanatana Dharma are its scriptures, temples, and gurus. Then we get the next section here. What are the main Hindu denominations? So this is a part of Hinduism that's not that well understood, but it is really key to understanding it clearly. There's four main Hindu denominations, and in many ways they don't agree. Today Hinduism is like a great banyan tree whose limbs represent the many variations of this ancient faith. Four branches or denominations are Saivism, Vaishnavism, Shaktism, and Smartism. Each has a multitude of guru lineages, religious leaders, priesthoods, sacred literature, monastic communities, schools, pilgrimage centers, and tens of thousands of temples. Since Hinduism has no one central authority, these are like four independent religions sharing a vast common heritage of history, culture, and belief. For two centuries, Western scholars have struggled to understand India's faith. They found it so vast and varied in its beliefs, practices, and ways of worship that they could not comprehend or describe it. What they didn't realize is that India's Sanatana Dharma, or eternal faith, is a family of religions with four principal denominations. For example, seeing so many deities, scholars wrote incorrectly that Hindus have no supreme god. In fact, Hindus all worship a one supreme being, though by different names. I jokingly say Hindus all believe in a one supreme being, they just don't agree on the name or the nature. <laughs> For Vaishnavites, Lord Vishnu is God. For Saivites, God is Shiva. For Shaktas, God is Shakti is supreme. And for Smartas, who are the most liberal Hindus, the choice of deity is left to the devotee. These strains arose in different geographical and linguistic regions. Each has its own beliefs, scriptures, religious leaders, and monastic traditions. Each has its own temples, festivals, and ways of worship. Some are more focused on devotion and temple worship. Others stress yoga, mantra, and scriptural study. Each has hundreds of millions of followers. All four accept the authority of the Vedas and the basic beliefs of karma, dharma, and reincarnation. Much of their culture and tradition is the same. Most Hindus follow the same lineage as their parents and grandparents. As Saivites, we respect all Hindu paths and we may occasionally visit the temples of other Hindu groups. We join in their festivals and honor their religious leaders but we hold firmly to our cyber path. Next section, Saivism. So what is Saivite Hinduism? Saivism is the world's oldest religion, worshiping God Shiva, the compassionate one. It stresses potent disciplines, high philosophy, the Guru's centrality, and the path of bhakti and raja yoga, leading to oneness with Shiva within. Saivism is ancient, truly ages, for it has no beginning. It is a precursor of the many-faceted religion now termed Hinduism. 
Scholars trace the roots of Shiva worship back more than 8,000 years to the Indus Valley civilization, but sacred writings tell us there was never a time when Saivism did not exist. Six schools of philosophy and tradition within Saivism. Saiva Siddhanta, Kashmir Saivism, Pashupata Saivism, Veera Saivism, Shiva Advaita, and Siddha Siddhanta. They differ in many ways, philosophically, historically, linguistically, and geographically. Still, they share an overwhelmingly similar similarity of belief and practice. In addition to the Vedas, the Saiva Agamas are the shared scriptures of all six schools. All six identify Shiva as the Supreme Lord, both eminent and transcendent, worshipped as the personal God, and realized through meditation as the absolute, Parashiva, beyond all form. All hold these principal Agamic doctrines. The five powers of Shiva, creation, preservation, destruction, concealing, and revealing grace. That would be a good question. What's that all about? The three primary elements of existence, Pati, Pashu, and Pasha, God's souls and bonds. Three bonds or malas, Anava, Karma, and Maya. Threefold energy of Shiva, Itcha, Kriya, and Jnana Shakti, which is desire, action, and wisdom. 36 tattvas, or categories of existence. The need for a Satguru and initiation. And the power of mantra. The four padas or stages of spirituality, charya and kriya, yoga and jnana. We'll come back to that, that's an important one. Which translates simply as service, devotion, union, and wisdom. So then we go to our particular school of Saivism, which is called Saiva Siddhanta. Saiva Siddhanta is the name of our school of Hinduism. It is today the oldest, most vigorous, and widely practiced of the six forms of Saivism and has many millions of devotees, tens of thousands <clears throat> of active temples and dozens of living monastic and ascetic traditions. Saiva Siddhanta once enjoyed a glorious presence throughout all of India. Today it is strongest within the Tamil regions of South India, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and elsewhere. In fact, it is sometimes referred to simply as Tamil Saivism. You can see the orange areas on the map. That's those areas are, uh, where Tamils live. The term Saiva Siddhanta means the final or established conclusions of Saivism. Today, there are two primary schools of Saiva Siddhanta. One is the pluralistic school of Mekandar, which holds that God, soul, and world are eternally separate. The other is the monistic school of Tudumular, stresses the ultimate oneness of man and God. We follow Tirumular's lineage, which is specifically called Shuddha Saiva Siddhanta. For both schools, Shiva is all in his divine manifest energy. Shakti is inseparable from him, which is what the graphic is showing. In temples, we often see Shiva and Shakti enshrined as two separate beings, a divine couple, but in truth, they are one. We worship Ganesha and Murugan as great lords who serve the creator, God Shiva. We chant the holy mantra, Nama Shivaya. We wear Rudraksha beads and holy ash. We revere the many Saivite saints. We believe it is necessary to have a living guru. Cherish the holy Shiva Linga. Keep company with other devout seekers and revere the great many Shiva temples. These four, Guru, Lingam, Sangam, and Valipadu worship are the essence of Saiva Siddhanta is found in ancient Sanskrit and Tamil literature. So who is Shiva? <clears throat> Lord Shiva is the supreme being of the universe. 
according to Saibism. He, she is all and in all, both the creator and the creation, within everything and beyond everything at the same time. Shiva has a threefold nature. His highest reality is beyond time and form. Second aspect is the divine mind existing here, there, and everywhere. His third aspect is the personal Lord, the creator, source of all time and all form. Only in the deepest meditation can the nature of such a vast and mysterious God be fully known. The name Shiva means the auspicious, gracious, or kindly one. Shiva is the one supreme being that all faiths have worshipped by many names and sought to understand for thousands of years. Shiva has five powers, as we mentioned earlier, creation, preservation, destruction, and the twin, twin graces of concealment and revelation. He creates the three worlds from his own being, and he also preserves the three worlds, dancing in each tiny atom at every point in time. Ultimately, he absorbs back into himself. He does this in great cycles of time spanning billions of years. Then in the next grand cycle of time, he creates again. Shiva is also the creator of individual souls like us. With his fourth and fifth powers concealing and revealing, Shiva governs and guides our evolution as a parent guides a child. should always worship this great God of love and never fear him. He is the self of ourself, closer than our breath. Gurudeva taught, his nature is love, and if you worship him with devotion, you will know love and be loving toward others. Shiva is the sun above us, the wind that cools the land, the five elements, the thought within our mind, spark of light within our body, that which lives and that which is inert. Beyond knowing, beyond gender, he, she is the deathless being who resides beyond the three worlds. It stands in souls united. Our holiest texts are the Vedas and the many Agamas. These large collections of religious books are called Shruti, that which is heard. This means they were revealed by God to Indian rishis long, long ago. For the Vedas, this possibly occurred more than 6,000 years ago. For many centuries, they were chanted from memory and finally written down in the Sanskrit language. The Rig, Sama, Yajur, and Atarva are the four Vedas, each as a section on hymns, rites, interpretation, and philosophy. Many of the mantras chanted during temple worship are from the Vedas. Upanishads are the most popular and mystical part of the Vedas. Agamas date back about 2,000 years and are also in Sanskrit. Each major Hindu lineage has its own Agamas. There were 28 main Saiva Siddhanta Agamas, each with four sections. Agamas provide knowledge in temple design and construction, daily worship, and festivals. They also provide teaching on meditation and Saiva philosophy. The Vedas have been published in many languages, but the Agamas are not yet widely known. In addition to the Vedas and Agamas, Saiva Siddhanta has thousands of sacred books and songs. These comprise a vast body of secondary scriptures called Smriti many of which are written in the Tamil language. Popular Smriti text is the Turumarai, a 12-book collection of hymns composed by numerous Saivite saints. Most important among these is the Turumandaram, a yogic treatise by Rishi Tirumular, recording the Saiva tenets in 3,047 verses. Turumandaram is prized for expressing a unified understanding of Siddhanta and Vedanta, Another important Smriti text is the Tirukaral, containing 1,330 couplets by the weaver saint Tiru Valluvar. Tirukaral, one of the world's greatest ethical scriptures, is sworn on in South Indian courts of law. We also regard the writings of our Sakh gurus as scripture. What are the past four stages? So this is important. Practical, it's what is practiced. A 
When created by Lord Shiva, the soul is young and immature. Its process of growing up over many lifetimes happens in four stages. This is much like the development of a lotus flower. First, it sends its roots into the pond's mud. Then it grows a stem and leaves that reach the water's surface. Finally, it blossoms in the full sun. Yet each previous stage of growth is still there supporting the flower. Shiva's grace guides this process so that we learn and grow toward the light through experience. Under the divine law of karma, as the soul progresses through each stage, it becomes less instinctive and more spiritual. Shiva is continually creating souls, so at any point in time, there are on the earth young souls, adolescent souls, middle-aged souls, and old souls. The four pada stages of maturation are Charya, Kriya, Yoga, and Jnana. Charya is good conduct and humble service, attending the temple and helping with temple chores. Here the main work is harnessing the instincts and developing virtuous qualities. Instincts means qualities like getting angry or fearful. We need to harness them or lessen their presence in our life. Kriya is the stage of devotion or love of God expressed through home puja and temple worship. In other words, it's a tradition where the family actually does religious ceremonies in the home, major ceremonies on a daily basis in orthodox homes. Yoga is a period of meditation and inner striving under a guru's guidance. At this stage, the temple is a sacred space for contemplation as Shiva's veiling power gives way to his revealing grace. And jnana is the wisdom state where the realized soul sees himself as one with Shiva. These stages are also experienced in each lifetime. As children, we learn good conduct as summarized in the yamas and niyamas. Then we are taught worship, expressing heartfelt devotion for God, gods, and guru. Next, we may learn to meditate with the goal of gaining true wisdom. The four potters are not alternate ways, but progressive steps on a one path called sanmarga. Nor does the soul give up the practice of one pada when it enters the next. Thus the mature soul in jnana is a paragon of wisdom, yoga, devotion, and virtue. The greatest yogis still love and worship Shiva. Oh, we have another one here on practice. What are our five core practices? Worship, holy days, pilgrimage, dharma, and rites of passage are the five areas of practice that Gurudeva recommended for all Hindus. In Sanskrit, they are called pancha nitya karmas. Pancha means five. Five permanent actions. First and foremost is daily worship, upasana. This is the core of religious life, the soul's natural outpouring of love for God and the gods. And that, of course, is done in the home. Next is Utsava, honoring holy festivals. Next is Utsava, honoring holy days when the blessings of the deities are strongest. We join with family and community in ceremony and feasting during the major Shiva, Ganesha, and Murugan festivals each year. Monday is the Hindu holy day in the north of India and Friday in the south. On this day, we attend the temple, clean and decorate the home shrine, and spend extra time in prayer, chop, and scriptural study. These are not days of rest. We carry on our usual work. Pilgrimage, Tirtha Yatra, is our third area of practice. At least once a year, we make a special journey to a holy place. It is a complete break from our usual concerns, during which God, gods, and gurus become the singular focus. These three forms of worship, daily puja, holy days, and pilgrimage, help us manifest our inner perfection in our outer nature. Our fourth area is dharma, living an unselfish life of duty and good conduct. Here the yamas and niyamas are our guide. Dharma includes being respectful of parents, elders, teachers, and swamis. Our fifth area of practice is rites of passage called samskaras. In English, the word is sacraments. These are personal ceremonies that sanctify and celebrate crucial junctures in life from birth to death. First major samskara is the name-giving rite. 
Others follow, including first feeding, ear piercing, and beginning of formal study. As an adult, the most important ceremony is marriage. At death, the soul is released from the body during sacred funeral rites. Rites of passage draw to us special blessings from the devas and deities, society and village, family and friends. This one you'll find interesting. What is the purpose of the temple? For those of you who aren't familiar with Hindu temples, the temple is where we worship and commune with God and the gods. Here devotees are uplifted and receive the inner help they need to live a positive, fulfilling life. Temples are sacred for three reasons. They are constructed in a mystical manner. They are consecrated with special complex rites. And thereafter, continuous daily worship builds a force field, a holy force field. Our grand cyber temples are like no other place on earth. Some are more than 1,000 years old. Strict rules from the Agamas are followed to create such holy spaces where holiness, God, can reside. Deva's gods and people work together to establish the temple and assure it will be used only for worship. Over the years, the power becomes strong, forming an invisible glass-like bubble or shield around the temple. This keeps out gross vibrations and allows the heaven worlds to be strongly present. <clears throat> you approach God's home, you can feel a spiritual energy, and as you go inside, you are engulfed in peace. Here the devas and gods can easily hear your prayers. Here the ancient scriptures are chanted, the traditional rites knowingly performed. Here joyous festivals are celebrated and arduous pilgrimages concluded. At the high point of puja, as bells ring loudly and conscious blow, the deity sends rays of blessings through the enshrined image, which is called a murti. Flooding your aura, this energy can erase worries, clear confusion, and relieve sadness. Devotees leaving the temple feel inspired and lightened of burdens. Gurudeva explained that the stone or metal images are not mere symbols of the gods. The image is the physical plane form through which the gods' love, power, and blessings flood forth into this world. The image is like a temporary physical body the god uses during temple ceremonies. The temple, God's home, becomes a truly sacred place for us when we know that gods are real beings and the purpose of going to the temple is to experience their blessings. So I put this slide here in case we were out of time, which we're not. So we'll do one more. I wanted to fit this one in. It's again interesting. How can we see God? Saivism teaches us that God Shiva is knowable and we can experience him right here and now. It is not just a matter of faith. The Guru's Guru, Parama Guru Yogaswami declared, See God in everything. You are in God. God is within you. God is in everyone. See him there. It takes much meditation to find God Shiva in all things, through all things. Gurudeva taught, He is there as the soul of each soul. You can open your inner eye and see him in others. See him in the world as the world. Perhaps the easiest place to start seeing God is in great religious teachers. We feel a spiritual aura about them that is uplifting. We see a light in their eyes we do not see in others. The mere sound of their words encourages us to live a more spiritual life. Another way to see God is to look deeply into the eyes of another person. Look beyond the personality, go deeper than his or her intellect, and see the pure life energy, which is God. This practice does not stop with people, but can also include seeing the life energy in trees, birds, and animals. Doing this, you discover that God is our life. God is the life in all beings. Becoming aware of this life energy and all that lives is becoming aware of God's presence. Burihadaranyaka Upanishad explains, He who knows God as the life of life, the eye of the eye, the ear of the ear, 
the mind of the mind. He indeed comprehends fully the cause of all causes. A third place to look for God is in the Hindu temple. In powerful temples, you can sense the deity's presence in the enshrined image, Murti, and even catch a glimpse of his divine form during the puja. This is done with your third eye, your inner eye of divine sight. Many people, not just saints and sages, have seen God in such mystical visions. Oh, we are now ready for questions, so I'll turn off the sharing. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. And I know I have questions, but I'm going to let everybody else go first. So if, if anybody does have questions that you would like to ask, I don't see any in the chat. So if you have go for it. Bodhi Natha, thank you very much for a very encompassing and beautiful presentation that you shared with us. I am wondering if you would say a little bit more about the idea that God both reveals himself or herself and conceals himself or herself. What is that tension or that dance about? Is that similar to, um, you know, a, a, a parent playing peekaboo with the child? You know, when mm -hmm. the parent reveals himself, the child is happy and giggling and laughing and feels comfort and feels safety. And when the parent conceals herself or himself, maybe the child is feeling a little uh, uncertain or anxiety and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how do you how do you uh, explain that a little bit more about why is God concealing and revealing herself himself? That's my question. Okay, well, thank you, Patrick. That's, uh, I thought that might be a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not obvious uh, what it means. Uh, it's, you have part of the idea, but it's also in a time sequence in that concealing happens first and revealing happens second. And it's the idea that God wants us to be totally engaged in the world and make something of ourselves in the world. In other words, we make spiritual progress by accomplishing things in the world. So we need to look at the world in a very real way and not want to head off to a monastery right away. So we are, God is hidden from us. Our interest is focused on the world. And I'm sure you know lots of people like that. They're not interested in religion. And in our tradition, we say that's great as long as you try and be successful in the world and you be kind and honest, etc. But there'll come a time when they start to become interested in religion or spirituality, and that's the revealing grace. It's a natural event. And if, if we think of the lotus flower, it starts the roots in the mud, and then it comes through the water, then it, you have the blossom, and then, I mean, you have the bud, and then you have the blossom. So we could say when it reaches the bud stage, that's the revealing grace. It's starting to uh, take an interest in spirituality and religion. Before that time, it wasn't interested. Hmm. When it's under the water, it's not yet interested. But it's a natural timing. And then it gets very interested, and then it gets uh, very involved in spirituality and uh, thinking about uh, being successful in one's religious spiritual practice. And, and does that revealing happen to all souls sooner or later in one lifetime or another? Exactly. That's the Hindu okay. point of view okay. versus some other religious points of view. Everybody, as I jokingly say in Hinduism, everyone goes to heaven. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> but not necessarily in this life. <laughs> right. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank We're you. We're all destined for heaven. No one's yeah. destined for hell. Okay. All, but you have Thank to you. wait. Okay, thank you, Patrick. And it looks like Liz has her hand up. Go ahead, Liz, your question. Sure, thank you. I came late, so I apologize if this was already addressed, but I heard a, a comment from the Swami that suggested that it's only at the end of life that one would be interested in spiritual pursuits. So could you elaborate on 
stages of life and uh, maybe address that question? Yes, well, uh, I didn't say that exactly in the presentation. I'm confident in that. What I may have said was, you know, it's at the end of lives, plural. Uh, there's an S on that. It's not a singular life, it's lives. So we need to live many lives. That's the Hindu point of view. We don't accomplish this all in one life. So the first few lives, we're not interested in religion and spirituality. Then the next ones, we get a little bit interested. And then in the last few lives, we're very interested. So that that's uh, how it fits in in the sense of lives. In the sense of an individual life, I didn't really address that, but to address it very quickly, it takes a different form. Um, in Hinduism, those who follow the path of the family with children and all, I like to say uh, your foremost spiritual practice is to take care of your family members, particularly in times of extra need. So it's a different spiritual practice. You're involved in other people more. And definitely when you're older, you have more time for uh, traditional spiritual things such as meditation and going on pilgrimage. But you're doing a different form of religious practice during different age groups. But it's all religious spiritual. It's just different. Great. Thank you. We also have a question from Jessica. You want to go ahead, Jessica? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and for, for being here. Um, and also for noting that everybody gets there sooner or later. I really that. I'm wondering if you can describe um, in, in just a very brief practical summary what type of meditation you teach? What does a, a, a meditation session look like for you know your new initiates? What type of meditation do we practice? That's the idea. Well, to us, meditation is an advanced practice. It's not where you start. And you see that in the, the names of our practices, Charya, Kriya, Yoga, Yana. So meditation is the yoga doesn't mean hatha yoga, it means meditation. It's third. So someone would normally follow the other practices for years before they take up meditation. The meditation we follow is based on Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga. And we're, we're trying to experience what's within us or what's in the soul. And so we're trying to go into the soul and experience things like the inner light, the sound of Om, and even deeper experiences. So we're, we're looking inside and experiencing what's there. And to do that, we have to be very quiet um, in our body, emotions, and thinking. That's it. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, M. Morgan, please. I'm sorry, I'm horrible at anything electronic media wise. Um, I had to unmute myself. I have asked this question um, for many people. I'd just like to hear your answer, which it seems to me is that um, many people sense, have a sense of the spiritual Every civilization, every person on earth has this sense, I think. But in every civilization, they give the same sense, a familiar name and a familiar visage. And is it necessary to human happiness to have a higher power or something to have faith in to name this sense of the spiritual is that necessary in every civilization to be human beings oh, of course not no it's not necessary uh, but in the hindu point of view everyone becomes spiritual at some point in the period of many lifetimes so it's natural in the sense of what's going to happen to an individual at some point but civilization may have very few people interested in 
in spirituality at a particular point in time, and therefore it's non-existent, so to speak. But the Hindu point of view is it's built into the soul. The soul is the lotus flower. It's going to, at some point, start in the mud, go through the water, and reach the surface. When it reaches the surface, it has an interest in spirituality. Thank you. So, That's a really helpful explanation. So it's okay. something that develops as the soul develops. Yes, it's natural. Your point of view. In one Thank lifetime. You. Okay. We have any other live questions? You can raise your hand. While you're thinking of your questions, I'm going to read one from the chat here. It says, since Buddhism is sourced in the Hinduism tradition, is it reasonable to consider it as a movement toward a reformed Hinduism? Uh, the simple answer is no. Um, Hinduism is based on the Vedas. So if you don't accept the Vedas, whatever you're doing is not Hindu. That's a simple way of delineating it. So we have Sikhism, Jainism uh, in India, but they don't, they're not based on the Vedas. So they're not considered Hindu, they're considered Indian, but not Hindu. So it, it's more like uh, Christianity is to Judaism. Orthodox Jews do not consider uh, Christianity as relating as a reformed Judaism. It's different. This is kind of a maybe a philosophy nerd question, but um, where does Sankhya fit into the relationship here between, um, as my understanding, Sankhya philosophy is the root of Jainism, Buddhism, and yoga. Is that is that correct? And where does it fit with regard to the Vedas? Yes, well, Sankhya is a philosophy, and it's not, uh, you know, it needs a religious context to call it a denomination of Hinduism. So it's, it's just a philosophy. So you can't relate it to Hinduism and its denominations per se. But, there, for example, uh, Saivism has similar ideas, but it takes them further. It's like it started with Sankhya and it kept going. <laughs> and as, as yoga, yoga is similar to Sankhya in many ways, and it, but it adds more than just Sankhya. So it's, it's a philosophy that fits in in various ways within Hinduism, but not in a, in a, one, not in a one way. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we have a question, Babsi Lin. Pardon me if I mispronounced. No, totally okay. Um, no, I was just, uh, I was curious as, as what the, you may have to say about what the Vedas may say as far as nutrition goes. I started following a Mayor Vedic way of living uh, mm -hmm. several years ago, uh, mindfulness and things, and, and wonder where uh, nutrition kind of fits in that as far as um, practice goes. Mm -hmm. So we're talking Ayurveda? Ayurveda, yes. Yes, yes I Ayurveda. didn't pronounce it right. <laughs> That's I all right. I have pronounced it right for years. <laughs> well, it's got the word Veda in it, so that gives us a right. clue, right? <laughs> right, right, right. This is that, that root. <laughs> Ayurveda means life. So yes. the wisdom of life or the wisdom of health. Um, well, it's in Hinduism, the secular scriptures are not really secular. So there, there are different parts of the Vedas. You have the four Vedas, which are the main Vedas, and then you have secondary scriptures, and Ayurveda is a secondary scripture to the Vedas. Because in the old days, there's not this division between religion and secularism. So health and medicine aren't considered secular in Hindu scripture. So it's... Uh, Ayurveda is traditional Hindu medicine, 
and the principles in it uh, guide Orthodox Hindus. But of course, all Hindus aren't vegetarian, but the principles in it are part of Hinduism, I'd say, because the scripture is part of the Hindu scriptures. Just like warfare, there's the scriptures on warfare. <laughs> so there's Hindu scriptures on all, everything that we consider secular isn't secular in Hindu scripture. So that's the, basically Ayurveda is Hindu's traditional, Hinduism traditional medicine. There's also a Siddha medicine, which is similar in, in, other, in some parts of India. So you have two of them, Siddha medicine and Ayur, Ayurvedic medicine. And I have another question. What distinguishes the Siddhanta sect of Saivism from the others? And I, mean, I know you could go into telling us all of the differences, but since mm. that's what we're talking about, um, could yes. you share, please? Well, uh, it's the others are, some of them are more, some of them exist only in history. <laughs> so, um, and some are very minor, like Kashmir Saivism is very minor at this point. But I'd say it's strong emphasis on the temple. I call it temple-centric. The beginning practices all involve going to a physical temple, doing certain things. So that is what distinguishes it from, and particularly for something like Kashmir Saivism, which is focusing on meditation and doesn't tell you to go to the temple. That's a simple answer. Temple-centric. Thank you. Do we have other questions this evening? Looks like Victoria is there. Yes, Victoria, please. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about uh, how you feel and how other devoted, um, devoted, well, I hate to use the word practitioners, that's partially what, that relates to my question, actually. Um, how how the, the, the devotees of the faith feel about the secularization of, um, of various practices, um, you know, most, I would, venture to say the average person on the street in the in sort of Western society thinks of yoga as purely a very, you know, effective way to exercise the body and and discounts the spiritual applications or the spiritual significance. And similarly with with, you know, diet and um, and then, of course, the whole secular mindfulness movement, which mm -hmm. um, clearly uh, well, I don't know how clearly. Uh, for me, it's clear that it that it it has spiritual origins, but that they've long since been completely expulsed from um, from the practice, and now it's become something that's um, been embraced, uh, particularly by modern psychologists, for example, where it's there's almost a, um, at least in in my experience, almost a militant um, attempt to really dissociate all of these practices from any kind of spiritual path. And I'm just mm -hmm. wondering how that's then handled and regarded by people of faith in your tradition. Well, I'd say uh, from one point of view, you simply laugh. <laughs> I, I was reading uh, uh, something, we have a group called Hindu American Foundation. It's a group uh, run by fairly youthful Hindus born in America and they were talking about yoga. One of their campaigns is to bring back yoga to Hinduism and they were joking about an animal posture being thought of as yoga, you know, whereas meditation, the word yoga means meditation, it means controlling the mind. It's nothing to do with postures, <laughs> yoga. Patanjali, yoga is the restraint of mental activities. No, there are no postures in there. It's it, you're controlling the mental activities. That's what yoga means in its original sense. So I'd say uh, some people laugh. Some are concerned about correcting it, such as Hindu American Foundation, and uh, 
Uh, it is uh, controversial. You know, you see it in the schools. Um, occasionally, yoga is taught in the schools, and then it goes to the school board, and they have to decide if it's Hindu or not. Different school boards have come up with different answers to that. Some say it has, it's not Hindu, therefore we can do it. Some say it's Hindu, we can't do it. But you see it discussed there. You see it in churches. Um, I remember one story I researched when I did an article on it was it was a Anglican pastor and Anglican minister in UK, and there was hatha yoga going on in his church, and he stopped it and said it was leading people into Eastern mysticism, and it was unacceptable for Christians to become Eastern mystics. Mm. So there are those who understand that it does, um, any type of yoga practice can lead deeper into types of mysticism and all. So it's kind of a mixed response is what I'm saying. There is not a one response. But in terms of how we look at it, uh, we say yoga is a Hindu practice and the postures which are called asanas are part of eight steps. Yama, 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 niyama, asana. Dharana, dhyana, samadhi, prachahara, pranayama. There we go. Yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, prachahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. So asana is you're pulling one thing out of the middle of the practice. And you're leaving the other seven untouched. And it's not the first one, it's the third one. So teachers like um, Iyengar, BKS Iyengar, he scolds people, he says, practicing the postures without yama and niyama is mere acrobatics. <laughs> well, he's the expert on the Hatha Yoga. So there are uh, people that are outspoken about it in the Hindu community, such as he, such as he is. Do you, um, do you feel that there, I mean, going back to your story of the Anglican pastor, mm -hmm. um, would you then from your position say that in fact, um, I know this sounds so strange, but that you would agree with, with his decision based on his, I mean, insofar as he was clearly not an interfaith oriented kind of a pastor oh, that, that, oh, that yes. it, you see it as a as a that it is a bringing another faith into um, it could. A Christian context it, it definitely could yes just chanting of om is controversial you know chanting om in schools and all uh, raises the question is that a hindu practice or can you chant om or not chant om so it's bringing in another faith and someone who's extremely orthodox won't want to do that such as that particular pastor Catholic Church has spoken out against it. In Malaysia, the Islamic Council has spoken out against it. So it, it's uh, Orthodox people who are the Orthodox leaders of other religions. Some of them have really spoken out, uh, saying that Christians or Muslims shouldn't practice yoga. In, in Malaysia, they say there's other forms of calisthenics. <laughs> you can ride a bicycle, you can go running, you don't have to do hatha yoga. <laughs> Well, I've heard the same um, the same opinion expressed about Tai Chi, for example, too. Mm, that right. that it's um, I know that I, I mean I had a Catholic friend who was um, almost excommunicated because she was someone found out that she was going to Tai Chi class once a week. It was very <laughs> it was a very extreme situation. She was a very devout Catholic, so she was just mm -hmm. shocked. But um, so um, anyway, I have a million other questions, but I didn't want to take, take time from other people questioning. So thank you. Okay. Well, how about one last question then, if there is one. Liz, did you have another question, Liz, or is your hand uh, still up? <laughs> it's, it's a question and a comment. Uh, the question is about um, how do you tackle the question of um, cultural appropriation and the comment is that we have a speaker who's coming to Miami University on April 13th, who has a book entitled, who is a scholar of religion and comparative ethics. And her talk is entitled Stealing My Religion. And she considers questions about 
cultural appropriation and ultimately decides that um, the answer to the ethical dilemma is, <laughs> well, I'll leave it, I'll leave it to folks to come to the talk and find out. But her name is Liz Bukar and she's coming to campus sponsored by the Comparative Religion Department, mm -hmm. 5 p.m. on uh, April 13th. And this yoga controversy is really central to what she is talking about. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate your comments. I've learned a lot from you. Thank you. Okay. Well, you're welcome. Very good then. Do we call it a wrap up? Is that good? Yes, I believe so. And thank you all for being here and devoting not that it's been really wonderful. I, I think we've all learned a lot and it sparks more thought as well. So thank you. And thanks for everyone for being here. Um, you can always check out our other programs on the Interfaith Center at Miami University's YouTube channel, or you can visit us on our website at OxfordInterfaithCenter.org. Everyone have a wonderful evening.